Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ episode number 100. The Knife series where I answer all your questions whether they're sharp or dull, but this week I'm not answering any of them. What? All right, folks, welcome to our 100th episode of this series. Wow, when we started this uh, beginning of 2020, early 2020, and it's just kept rolling. And that's thanks to you folks out there who keep submitting your questions in the comments section below these videos. And we get to kind of pull some of the ones we think are gonna be fun and answer them in episodes anteceding. We're off to a great start like already. Uh, it was pretty normal for this is us. Just part of the course for us. <laughs> So thank you folks uh, for making this series a success. It's one of my most favorite ones uh, that we film on a weekly basis. Uh, but as I mentioned, we do something a little bit different this week. We do have some questions to answer, but it's gonna be a little bit uh, not quite what you expect. Uh, for the first question uh, comes from Suhail Kaspar who says, I heard that the formidable backlock comes with a slight disadvantage as it compromises blade stability after a period of continued use, since the lock pedal moves up and down as you open or close the knife. And that places great pressure on the central pivot. Uh, personally, I tend not to believe that, but would like to hear your opinion. Thanks. Uh, this is a great in the weeds question to get started with. And rather than answering it myself, I've got someone on the line here who, they make quite a few lockbacks and know a thing or two about engineering. Mr. Eric Glesser from Spyderco. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Hey, th uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Um, I thought this would be, you know, you obviously know more uh, than I do about the intricacies and the engineering of how this uh, type of mechanism is built. So I thought it would be real cool to get uh, your insight on this, because I'm sure you've heard things kind of like this over the years. And, and what's your response to that? Um, well, uh, right off the bat, the backlock is one of my favorites. Uh, but uh, when I hear a question like that, I would I would question what it's inferior to. Um, naturally, there's a lot of different locks to compare, and every single lock has pros and cons. Um, but with this question in particular, it sounds about the pivot uh, and the area and the pressure that it puts on something like the pivot. And so I guess, you know, I'll address that directly. Um, you know, with, with a lot of springs or any lock, they have a spring in them. And where that spring is adding tension whether it's like a ball bearing where it's pushing side pressure or like a back block where it's putting you know, pressure down on the blade itself, which does put pressure on the pivot. Any lock you has, have does have some of these, these issues. Um, and so for us, you know, the balance of what that material is uh, as far as the pivot, the blade, the lock, the spring, even the, um, the scales and liners are a big part of that mm -hmm. um, because they're helping back that up is all very important. So what those materials are is probably the first most important thing. Uh, and then those tolerances that you have in there, um, as far as even, you know, the, the pivot size compared to the hole in the blade. If you have a, a really loose blade, for example, um, you know, with a, with a loose tolerance, that blade has more tendency to move around in there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a tighter tolerance, you're, you're going to get a better fit. Um, and so, you know, what, the, what it's made out of, uh, then what those tolerances are, and then what those sizes are, you know, how thick is the blade, uh, how big is the outside diameter of that, that pivot, uh, how much spring force are you giving the lock itself? You know, for the back lock, one of the great features of the back lock is that it self closes really well. Mm -hmm. Where a ball mm -hmm. detent, once you overcome that, it frees it and it can just swing open fairly freely. Um, and so for safety, backlock has always been one of my favorites to carry because of that additional self-close. Um, but it's always adding that spring tension on there. And, and so, you know, for us, you want the, the lock to be easy enough to press that you're not hurting your thumb uh, to unlock it. You want it to have good self-close. You want it to have good action. You want a nice solid lockup. And trying to balance that spring tension to, to, to match all those things is something that we work heavily to balance. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and so, you know, really does that, um, as far as being inferior on, on, on wearing a pivot. Um, I think that in the world of back locks, because it's one of the oldest locks 
in the market as far as folders, there's a lot of examples out there to reference. Mm -hmm. uh, even the ones that we make are, are from different countries. And oftentimes we have different geometries for wear and tear and the way those function, mm -hmm. uh, even within the way we do it. Um, and so it's a big world for backlocks. Um, I don't think that they're inferior, I guess, in the pivot uh, area, especially if you build them well. Uh, there are some knives that we have tens of thousands of openings and closings, uh, testing those kind of things. Even, and I know I'm getting long-winded here, but oh, even man. for us, <laughs> uh, we have little machines that we set up that open and close and push buttons. And, and we really try to see, you know, how many cycles we can get out of these things. For us, you know, 50,000 cycles is a good start. It's a good um, start. And so, <laughs> um, and, well, and so, if I could you ask, know, is that going to wear, wear it out or not? So. When, when you do start to see, because I, I think, you know, this person was asking about the pivot. For me, when I think of like where a backlock's going to start to kind of show its age would be more about the, uh, the interface between the back spring and the tang of the, the knife. Like where over time might introduce a little bit of wiggle or something. Um, is, you know, but you, you, you guys say you're testing it to these, you know, thousands of, of openings, but... When you do get problems back, uh, like from your warranty department, specifically for the lockup or the lockback part of things, what's the most typical thing you guys see uh, in that regard? For getting them back in, in, in warranty and repair, for example. Right. So like what, what are the problems that, that you guys have corrected that you, that you do see? I guess it's an evolution. Issue? I have to think about that. Um, but. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that we probably most commonly see is that, that things get caught in the back lock or the hammer, the interface with the hammer and the blade. Mm -hmm. um, that in production, you know, that might be something we see. Now, in R&D and experimenting, we've seen a lot of funny things. I remember once when the blade was too hard for the, the back lock itself, it wore a groove right in there and mm -hmm. started to reshape the hammer itself. Um, or I've had hammers that were so hard they would break out the back of the tang. Mm -hmm. um, or the pivot material is so soft that after that blade cycles enough that you're literally cutting the pivot away. Um, and so those those different, and you have to have different materials so that you don't get that galvanic uh, issue. Mm -hmm. And so the hardness and then the material choice is a huge issue in that. Um, but for our warranty and repair, you know, we don't get a lot. Um, side to side can happen. Um, but you know, you try to, with all knives, you, you want to keep it, you know, up to snug. You want to keep it maintenance. Um, if you're really hard on that, those kind of things can develop, um, for a pivot. The other thing I think about is the head, the head size. You know, if you have too small of a head on those pivots and it's jarring too much, it's going to want to work its way out. Um, so having a nice, you know, generous sized head for what you're trying to do on those, those pivots. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, I hope that somewhat answers your question. <laughs> well, we love getting into the weeds uh, on this uh, this FAQ series here, so I think it's great. <laughs> um, so basically, yeah, moral of the story of sounds like, you know, engineer it right and use the good stuff. You don't really have anything to worry about. Yeah, you know, and if you ever do, we, we learn from it. You mm -hmm. know, for us, we have you know, millions of backlocks in the field uh, for decades, um, and we've learned a lot about it. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, it's a balance of usually a few different things, blade, lock, spring, scales, pivot. Uh, usually if you're going to break something, it's one of those. Uh, we will break things with a high def camera frame by frame and compare it to graphs so that we know what broke and how it broke mm -hmm. um, and then try to improve. Uh, and it's always getting better. So CQI, constant quality improvement. Um, we have some more backlocks that I'm excited will be coming out yeah. next year. Um, and, and I look at the way we're engineering those and those are even getting better too. You know, it, when you start taking apart backlocks and you see the way that hammer wears its way down into the blade uh, over time, that's a real evolution for mm -hmm. us and, and will continue to be. Um, but yeah, there's a lot there. That's cool. And, and if anyone's worried about it, you guys, again, you, most companies do, but Spyderco, of course, does it well, have a, a great warranty behind it and they'll probably take care of you too. So. <laughs> yep. Good stuff. Um, yeah. And then you get into the, how it looks. You know, is the H clean? Do you have a sanded spine? Are there any gaps between the liner and the scale? And, mm -hmm. and there's this whole how does it function and then how does it look? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we all do, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Great stuff. Well, Eric, uh, I think this was great. Thank you for joining us uh, for the first question on our episode 100 of this FAQ series. Thanks for giving me the time. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. All right, so for this question, I brought in our good friend, uh, prolific knife designer, uh, works with Condor, Tops, Artisan Cutlery, and others at this point, uh, an all-around good friend and good camping buddy, Joe Flowers. Um, here he is joining us. Joe, I have a question for you. Sure, shoot. So a lot of people, uh, or, or oftentimes I think the terms bushcraft and survival tend to be used interchangeably, if, if not at least just in tandem, because there is a lot of overlap, I think, between the two genres. But, yeah. But as a knife designer, where do you draw the distinction? Like when you're designing a bushcraft knife or when you're designing a survival knife, where do you draw the line? Are there features that you, you feel are appropriate for one and not the other? Curious to see how you approach this, uh, this difference here. Sure. And, and guys, real quick, everybody has opinions, multiple, even from <laughs> one person. So just keep that in mind. It's just my opinion. And so I'm an 80s kid. You know, I, I grew up in the 80s and that was when this idea of survival was like that Rambo style blade. And, and we'll get to the word survival and bushcraft in a second. But like uh, this book from the 90s, Everybody's Knife Bible, which is this crazy like Microsoft paint <laughs> style uh, thing, shows billions of different knives used for survival. But you really don't see any mention of even the word bushcraft you know, in there. And so you've got this idea, what is survival versus bushcraft? And how does that, you know, translate into a knife? Well, to me, like survival is the idea of leaving an area and trying to get out of a situation where you want to get through it, you know, to survive. Right. But, um, bushcraft is more of using the environment around you, at least to me, to make you more comfortable um, and of course with me being a knife nut, you know, that just means fix everything with a knife. <laughs> so you've got these features where you might want something more for a bushcraft knife, like say, uh, uh, wh what's that on your table there? Is that a, a dark lure? So yeah, I, I grabbed two things uh, that we happened okay. to just have filmed recently. Cause for me yeah. personally, I think both of these are good examples of, you know, you've got your dark lure design, which is of course based off the bush lure, which mm -hmm. to me, that's a straight up bushcraft knife. Yeah, uh, and the uh, the new tactical pass series from Jason Breeden, fellow mm -hmm. designer uh, at Condor, with you. Yeah, to me, this is kind of a survival knife design. Yeah, so you know there are features now that have kind of um, uh, transformed the bushcraft world in knives, where people are looking more for much more um, uh, uh, robust robust knives out there. But let's not forget that like the bushcraft guys come from a lot of different um, cultures where you're doing a lot of woodwork. And so there's edges on a bushcraft knife that work much better for woodwork. Whereas per se, I would much rather use a survival knife, be it a hollow grind or a full flat grind with a, um, a secondary bevel for something for an all incurred all encompassing thing like working heavy meat, um, self-defense or something like that. Now, of course, there's this area where they both mix, mm -hmm. where if you have like a, a really good flat grind with a secondary bevel or really, really, really like dozier style, like, like hollow grind, those will work would very well. And of course, some people can use a Scandinavian grind knife, you know, the knife with the big bevel, um, and even put a micro bevel on it. Um, to be used as a more multi-use tool. But at least to me, the biggest difference is bushcraft is focusing more on woodcrafting and the word crafting, where you're making you know material out of the stuff around you, where a survival knife is meant to be a bit more robust to do more multitasks. Um, more of like maybe, a one tool option type of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you got it. It might not whittle as well, but it's probably going to work... Um, meat or or heavy duty stuff a lot better than say a scandinavian blade from any company it doesn't matter who mm -hmm. um and and you'll see like uh some of the most basic bushcraft knives out there are, of course some of the moras the more number one um you see that a lot of different places where these guys have some really big skill set but they're able to use that small knife um just like morris kahansky loved you know, to do a lot of these different tasks. Whereas you see these survival knives kind of have more of a military feel, a little bit more of a um, uh, rougher around the edges for crafting. 
um, depending on who's using it uh, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always seen, like, to me anyway, there is a bit more, like, a, of a tactical influence on yeah. some of the survival stuff, or can Ab be anyway, yeah. Absolutely, um, and, and when you think about that, too, like, the military stuff has a segue into that, because in the outdoors, you need heavy-duty stuff that can just be used very, very mm -hmm. uh, harshly to, to function. So, cool. Um, finger guards, where do you stand? Um, me personally, I go for that Scandinavian style where there's no finger guards. Um, I personally, unless I'm, I'm rushing it, I, uh, don't actually ever cut myself this way, except for when I'm working like all day long, really hard and they're tiny little cuts. <laughs> um, and, and especially if you're, if you're working well, um, where the finger guard of course comes into play is that tactical, you know, Hey, don't rub up on it. Of course you can take your thumb and hold it back that way. So mm -hmm. it's just me. My personal preference is I'm not a finger guard lover, but I don't mind them that much yeah. either. Yeah, I've seen at least on, on some of your designs, I think some of your bushcraft stuff, mm -hmm. finger guards, if they're there, are, are a bit smaller yeah. um, versus yeah. a, a survival. I'm leading the witness now, of course. I'm sorry, folks. Yeah, no, no, that's <laughs> it's, it's true too. But, you know, then again, you don't see finger guards a lot on tactical uh folding knives too not mm -hmm. all the time just depending there is a hump there but um that's just for me my personal preference but i try as a designer not to keep myself into that area because i love all knives yeah <laughs> true well very cool um some cool uh insight onto the the subject folks hope you enjoyed it thank you all right so this next question um i'm gonna go to the guy who's literally written the book on the subject uh Joining us now, we've got Mr. Mark Zaleski, who, in addition, I'm going to tell you the title of the book here in a minute, folks, uh, and it'll become apparent the reason why. I'm not going to say it out loud just yet. But Mark is also the uh, owner, editor-in-chief of Knife Magazine. So, Mark, how you doing, sir? I'm doing great, David. How are you? Doing great. It's good to see you, as always. Um, the question I have for you today, first of all, thanks for being part of this episode. Um, but the question I have for you today is I'm going to hold a piece of paper up here real quick. Okay, there's a, there's a word written on this piece of paper. I know that word. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen at home, I'm sure you can see this as well. Now, for as long as I've been making videos, no matter how I say this word, someone will invariably or inevitably leave a comment that I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. And since you have, as mentioned, quite literally written the book on this subject, one of the books. <laughs> it's a pretty definitive book, I'd say. I, I want to know from you, like, what's your take on this? How do you pronounce it? Is there a, a is there a settled upon pronunciation, or are we all just kind of, uh, you know, tilting at windmills, so to speak? Well, I would say that there is a settled pronunciation, although there there's a geographic element to this mm. as well. But to, to me, it's it's a it's buoy. Uh, as in Bowie Knife and James Bowie and Reason Bowie and all that sort of thing. Uh, and yet I can admit that I grew up saying Bowie myself. And um, the, the real transition for me in, in getting this correct happened somewhere along the way uh, in my collecting and also in my relocation. I, I grew up in eastern Iowa and I have noticed a tendency for Yankees to say Bowie. Mm. Uh, but in the South, it's Bowie. Bowie is better known down here and, mm -hmm. and more recognized. But uh, but the bottom line is that, I mean, the, the Bowies were Scottish, of Scottish origin, uh, but they lived in the South, uh, you know, in southern Arkansas yeah. is where John was. And then, uh, you know, Reason and James uh, were, were in Louisiana most of the time, mm -hmm. uh, born in Kentucky. Well, they're born in different places. James was born in Kentucky. but. Uh, they were in Lo Louisiana most of the time. Louisiana is French-speaking territory, and you would pronounce Bowie, Bowie there. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I, I presume that's that's how we got to to Bowie and how it became the standard. So we can essentially assume that uh, James Jim pronounced his name that way, and we should probably pronounce it that way ourselves when we're talking about the knife. Then I I believe so, and it, it may be actually that the name was pronounced correctly more often back in the 1950s when he was on TV all the time, the adventures of James, 
Can we read that? The Adventures of James Bowie TV show, which they come on, they start singing Jim Bowie, Jim Bowie, and they get it right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, a lot of the things were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but that one thing they got right. <laughs> trying to promote all that stuff. But in, in this particular case, they had that right. I think it's right in the Iron Mistress as well. Very cool. Um, well, I, I did pull one here just to, to look at. I have a uh, Randall Smithsonian Bowie right here, which is, I believe is based on one that's uh, on display in one of the Smithsonian museums, given its name, but uh... Uh, sort of, yes, ah, sort yes. of, sort <laughs> of an interpretation Randall construction style, yes. <laughs> Basically, I pulled it out because it's just awesome, and I wanted to <laughs> get get an excuse to hold a Randall. <laughs> A Bowie knife should be. It should, right. be. it should be big and have a clip point and a big lugged guard and, and all that sort of thing. Um, Which isn't always the case, though, right? Oh, certainly not. But, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I, I like the... I like the, the clip points, too. This is a this is a Roger Green right here. Roger oh, that's Green nice being, looking. Yeah, Roger Green being the uh, heir apparent to D.E. Henry. Oh, I have a Henry, too. Where's it? The E. Henry. Uh, I love the handle on that one. That's uh, nice. Oh, yeah. This, this is derived directly from a particular style of a uh, guardless coffin buoy um, that Henry took the form and stripped it of all the studs and all that stuff and just simplified it. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is, you know, this is just beautiful and elegant and uh, and uh, everything that a a custom, not a reproduction, but an interpretation should be. Well, I look the. I feel like today there's kind of two schools of of Bowie knife thought. There's folks that that pull from the historical examples, and and you especially like you you. For folks out there who don't know, Mark's knowledge of this is and all kinds of vintage knives is practically encyclopedic. Um, so you've got kind of that school of thought, and the the other one I see, which is different but equally as cool sometimes, is you know a Bowie knife is just something that. You know, it's a genre where knife makers just kind of get to show off what they can do and and have fun with it, even if it's not kind of historically based. And those are fun too. But yeah, <laughs> absolutely, it's cheesy, but I love to say Bowie is in the eye of the beholder. Oh, I love that. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that's I think that's a great way to uh, to end this part. Um, again, folks, uh, check out Knife Magazine uh, and the book uh, A Sure Defense: The Bowie Knife in America. Um, if you can find one nowadays, they're harder to, to get a hold of, uh, but I suggest snapping it up if you, uh, if you get a chance because it is a, a pretty impressive tome of knowledge right there. Yeah, there, was, there was one on Amazon the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. At a slightly elevated price. But Indeed. Not too <laughs> Good stuff. Mark, <laughs> thank you so much, my friend. Uh, we'll see you at SHOT Show, I'm sure. That sounds great, David. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. All right, big thanks to our, uh, our special guests this week. Uh, but now we come to the lightning round. Uh, the question comes from Arturo Guerrero. Hi, DCA. We already know that your favorite blade shape is Nesmuk, and for Thomas, well, reverse Tonto, it's actually a cheese knife, but that's okay. Um, but which one does Seth prefer? Seth? Spear point. It's rather straight to the point, isn't it? That's our lightning round for today, folks. Uh, and before we get to our most serious question of the day, I just want to say again, thank you so much uh, for making this FAQ series an ongoing thing. They're awesome. You guys are awesome. You always come up with some really interesting things to talk about, which keeps me involved in you know the passion of things. It's you know, I, I never like these FAQ videos to feel like a like a full on sales pitch. This is the fun stuff. But now we do come to our most serious question of the day, which comes from Thomas Grable. Uh, DCA, you found yourself lost in the desert with a kit packed by Thomas. <laughs> I'm already worried. Which reverse Tonto knife would he have packed for you? All right, Thomas has picked something here. So this is, I'm, I'm gonna take a look at it, but this is Thomas picking stuff, so I have, so I haven't, I'm not officially answering the question. This, this is it. That's it. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> this is an MKM. It's the, uh, what's the name of this? The, uh, yeah, that's, it, it's on the screen. It's on the screen. On our viewer's screen. Oh, I can't see it over there. 
I remembered the, the designer's name, but I, the, the name of the knife is the edge. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I had no idea how he was going to go with this, whether it was going to be legit or not. Well, it's sub three inches, so it's legal to carry just about everywhere. And it's non-locking, so you don't have to worry about those laws. Are you just repeating things I say now? Yes. <laughs> look, look, it's bad enough to end up in jail for your knife. You don't want to end up in desert jail. <laughs> All right, desert jail. What? Gosh. All right, so let's let's evaluate this as a survival knife, shall we? A desert survival knife, specifically. Well, sand probably going to be a concern in desert. Not all deserts are sandy, but you know, uh, at least we don't have any ball bearings to uh, worry about in this slip joint. Um, never recommend a slip joint for a, a survival knife though, man, that's not my thing. Um, it's lightweight, so it'll be easy enough to carry. And at least you uh, afforded me a nice leather pocket slip right here. And if you get hungry, you can boil that and eat it. I'd sooner use it as a, uh, a an impromptu strop for the blade right there, because you know, one could certainly do that sort of thing. We'll see how much food you have. <laughs> this isn't going to help me much procure that stuff. But did you know you can actually baton small logs, small sticks with a slip joint knife? Yeah, I figured you would. The trick to do this, I've, I've seen it done. Uh, props to uh, Felix Imler, who uh, I saw doing this with the Swiss Army Knives, great channel over there, by the way. You want to. Uh, kick it into the half open position, set it on your log, and then you could start beating on it. That's, that's the way to do it for that sort of thing. But if you prepare some wedges, once you get it split, you can you put the wood wedges in and, and split it the rest of the way. I mean, at least it's got good fin fin finish and strong lockup. I mean, uh, a strong walk and talk, I should say. Matches your shirt. Sorry, everyone out there who's having trouble seeing this knife right now. Yeah, I mean, Okay. I don't think he likes it. That's, you couldn't, uh, okay. I was hoping, I was hoping it'd be something that like really thought out and it's like, oh, this would actually work. I had thought about may, it. Maybe you would have learned something from these 100 episodes. It's that, legal to point. carry. <laughs> Instead, he went for the gag. Okay, fine. Mr. Thomas Grable, that's the knife right there, the MKM Edge. So there you go. You could, they did a liner locking version of this one that we saw at Blade Show. You couldn't even pick that one? Nope. <sighs> Thanks, Thomas. Anytime. That's it for episode 100, folks. Again, thanks for sticking around and keep putting your questions in the comments. We're not going to stop doing these episodes. You haven't gotten rid of us after uh, 100 episodes of these, and we're certainly not going to slow down now. If you want, well, this is the part where I usually say if you want to get your hands on any of these knives, but there's only one on the table at the moment. But we'll leave a link in the description nonetheless, so you can head over to knifecenter.com. And of course, as always, don't forget about our Knife Rewards program, because if you're going to buy this knife, you might as well earn some free money to spend on your next one. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center. That's Thomas behind the camera. We're signing off. See you next time. Wait till you see what's in your canteen. <laughs> <laughs>